Soon after I became Christian, I had this image in my mind for some years, and I enjoyed it every time I thought about this image. That is, I am already in heaven, and I am waiting in the line among many, many people. And I am waiting in the line. And far in the front, there's God sitting on the judgment seat and judging every single soul. And one person will be asked to go to the lane to my right and stand there. And all these people, their faces will be gloomy, saddened, and in fear because during their time on earth, they rejected the gospel. They did not believe in Jesus, so they are destined to, do, to be doomed in hell. But there's another line on my left, and the people who are asked to stand on the other left lane, they're rejoicing their faces with a big smile. And now I'm waiting in the line. I'm visiting, and I am a little bit scared. And the line gets shortened and shortened and shortened. And I'm facing God the Almighty. And he asked me to go to the left lane. And I'm full of joy. And I'm so lucky. I'm the lucky boy in the entire universe. I'm chosen by God. I'm saved by his grace. And eternally I'll be living with my God with a total bliss. It's a wonderful thing to be chosen by God, to be included in his shipboard, to be chosen as his child. Even in this world, if you attend or participate beauty pageant, if you are chosen among top three, you will be excited, ladies, won't you? It's always good to be chosen, to be accepted rather than be rejected. Last year, when our EM was awarded with grand prize for choir performance, we became ecstatic. It's exciting to be chosen. Today, we are going to continue on with the book of Mark, how Jesus will decide to choose 12 disciples out of massive multitude. We want to continue on with the book of Mark, chapter 3, and by examining the way he chooses his 12 disciples, the way he continues to make disciples of 12, we want to also learn how to lead our life of a disciple. So let's turn our Bible to the book of Mark, chapter 3, from 13 through 21. Let us read the book of Mark, chapter 3, from verse 13 through 21. I will read verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those who himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. And to have a power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he was, the name Peter... James, the son of Jebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name of Boanerges, something like that. That is, the sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, and the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, and they went into a house. Then the multitude came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. Twenty one all together. But when, when his own people, people heard about, about this, they, they went, went out to lay hold, hold of, him, of him, for they, they said, he is, he is out of his mind. We don't know when this took a place, but we know that his fame went abroad, so much multitude will follow Jesus to receive teaching and heard about the kingdom of God, and also receive healings, and people be set free from their spiritual bondages. And while many, many people still followed him, one day he went up to a mountain, and he prayed all night long, 
The same account is recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. And we can see Jesus praying all night long. And during the daytime, he will decide to choose 12 disciples. So book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 12 and through 13. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was a day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them, he chose 12 whom he also named apostles. Because a selection is so important, Jesus, relying upon the Father always, he spent all night long in his prayer to choose 12 among all these followers. He already had a disciples committed their lives to follow Jesus all the way. And among many disciples, among all these multitudes following Jesus, out of them, he will only choose 12 disciples. And that procedure will take much prayer. He prayed all night long to hear the voice of the Father for whom he should choose. As a leader in the ministry, selecting leaders that process is very important because according to whom I choose as a leader, it can negatively influence the ministry and it will become a such a headache to the leadership. But if we choose according to Lord's leading, and that person can really affect ministry and benefit all of us. So it's important not just look at our appearance, their experience, their education, or their present commitment even. Sometimes it can be deceptive, but we need to kneel down before God and spend much time in prayer and asking God whom we should select as deacons or elders, cell leaders, whomever we choose to be the leader. I become extra careful. I become extra cautious. We affirming, we confirming through the prayer. And once I hear the voice, I go to God again and ask other leadership to pray together with me and pray again and again. Be reaffirmed to choose one man and one woman because God uses one person to influence entire world. So Jesus prayed all night long and chose 12 of them. And we know these names. First one was Peter. His Nickname was a Kephas, or Peter, it means rock. And then goes on with the James and John and Andrew, Thomas, Bartholomew, and all these names, including Judas Iscariot, 12 of them. We don't know much detail about each one's life other than Peter and John and James. And we heard about much about Andrew. And history tells us that all of them were murdered except John the Apostle. But because the Bible doesn't give us the details, instead of relying upon those details, but let's learn the way Jesus chooses 12 disciples, the way he discipled these 12 so that we can learn from his method and ways so that we can lead a life of disciple By asking us five questions, and by answering them, we can learn the way Jesus chooses and also leads and also make a disciples. First question we want to ask is, who chooses whom? Who is choosing whom? This is very important because it says in the Bible, in verse 13, he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. Jesus chose 12 disciples through the prayer. God chooses us. We did not choose God. He, by His sovereignty, by His own selection process, He chose you and I to be His children. By His grace, by His mercy, by His sovereignty, we are chosen to be His children. We are saved. There is no merit from us that we can boast about our salvation because it was a completely by the sovereignty of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And the only attitude that we can bring before God is, we thank you so much. Because it's not by my own righteousness. It's not by my own good deeds. It's by His grace and mercy alone. And by His sovereignty alone. And our attitude should be gratitude, humility, and giving thanks unto the Lord. Quite often when we share the gospel to other people, the question they have is challenging authority or sovereignty of God. Why? Because 500 years ago, in Korea, in China, in Japan, many, many people lived, but they never had a chance to hear the gospel. Are you telling us that they all perished in hell? Yes. Why? God is not fair. We don't know the answer to that. But we humbly must accept God's sovereignty. He chose whom He delights, and He disregards whom He disregards. We just have to accept his sovereignty as a creation, the creator's choice. It's the same way choosing disciples as well. Jesus chose the 12 disciples. We ourselves did not choose him to be my master. It takes the humility to accept that. And even in the church setting, when we make a disciples, when we choose whom that we want to make a disciples, the discipler has to make that choice. Sometimes with the humility, followers would come, can you disciple me? I had a few of them myself, and I don't think that's anything wrong with it. Humbly, if you have that desire, you can be discipled under certain man or woman. Second question that we want to ask is, why 12? Why did Jesus choose 12? Not, why not 11? Why not even 13? Why not even seven? Why not even 100? Why was 12 to be exact? Because so that when Judas is squared after his betrayal, he became miserable and he killed himself. So one was missing. And remaining 11 disciples cast a lot and chose Matthias to be included and make a complete 12. Why is number 12 so necessary? The reason is, number 12 is a governing number. When God governs the entire universe and the world, He uses a dozen. 12 is a number of government. So there are 12 months in a year, governing seasons. And there are 12 hours in a day, 12 hours at night. We have 24 hours a day. And also, God... As he began his kingdom of God using Israelites, he chose 12 the, the tribes. Likewise, Jesus chose 12, number 12, because when 12 people get together, there's a government and there's a governing dynamic happens. And church in Bogota, Colombia, many years ago, church is called the MCI, the senior pastor, Cesar Castrano, decided to choose the first generation of 12 disciples. And generation after, one disciple under senior pastor will also choose the 12 of them and it exploded. And they, last time I heard, had uh, over 800,000 church members. But amazing thing about it is their discipleship strategy with the number 12, a taxi driver under him will have thousands of cell churches. And college girl will have under her about 800 cells. I'm not talking about church members. We are talking about cell churches. Then number wise, we pray if there's a Lord leading in the future, maybe we can have a 12 disciples of first generation and continually trickle down. But if we don't have any 12, does that mean... Discipleship will not be effective. No. We can choose starting with a three. We can choose a ten. And we have a ten cell leaders. So we bi-weekly meet together to continually grow and so forth. Studying and making disciples and being disciples is more important, I believe, rather than number. But the number with a strategy being governing will become very effective. Third question that we want to ask. Among 12, there was one who betrayed Jesus. 
and Jesus knew about him. And Judas Iscariot will be betraying Jesus. And Jesus, with the full knowledge, already knew. And he was also prophesied in the Old Testament by King David. Out of King David's mouth in the book of Psalm chapter 41, verse 9, it said, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Judas Iscariot was prophesied a long time ago, but Jesus will still choose Judas as one of twelve. Why? Would you choose your followers? If you know in advance he or she will betray you, will backbite you, if I was a Jesus, I would not choose a Judas. But he chose, giving us an example. We don't know exactly the details, reason. But one thing that we can be clear about, choosing Judas Iscariot, that him being included among 12, there's a lesson. Because everything that is recorded in the Bible is as an example to edify us, to teach us, and to correct us. There's a reason why a betrayer is included in that 12. The reason is that God teaches us not to rely upon man or woman, only rely upon God. We are not to trust man or woman. We are only to trust God himself alone. Men are like a grass. One day they blossom, the other day they will perish. They are weak, they wither. They are wicked sinners, totally deprived and self-centered. All of us in this room, once we were betrayed, and also we betrayed others, most likely. That's why Judas was included, so that Jesus will now depend upon these guys. He will not rely upon men. He will only rely upon God. Because every single person, if you rely upon God, you will pray for them. Even as a pastor. I have an associate pastor at EM, and also at EDU, I have associate pastors. Do you think I trust them? Absolutely not. I don't trust them. And they don't trust me. <laughs> you should not trust me. Just because I am a pastor. You should trust God who is behind my back. If I go astray, he will punish me and turn me to the right path. You trust God alone and him be the glory. When we do that, we will not get hurt because of other people disown me. Just because I am a pastor, I ask associate pastor, do this, do that. They obey all the time. No, absolutely not. I need to pray for them so that Holy Spirit can convict his heart or her heart to do the work of God together. And that's how we rely upon God and trust God alone. In any relationship, when you are betrayed, there's a clear message from God. God is saying to you, do not trust a man or woman. Come to me. Just rely upon me and trust me. The people are there so that you love them and serve them, but not trust them. Nowhere in the Bible, not even a single verse is there that you ought to trust men. But you ought to trust and rely upon God and Him alone. Many, many times. That's why Judas was included. Fourth question that we want to ask, what was the purpose of choosing 12 disciples? Why did it Jesus chose these disciples? There are two reasons. There are two purposes why Jesus chose these disciples. If we go back to the Bible, again, he says, verse 14, Then he appointed the twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have a power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons and so forth. First reason, the purpose why God chooses you and I as His disciple is to have an intimacy with Him, to be with Him, to have a loving relationship with Him. Being a disciple is not like an employee being used by our boss to do the work, to make a profit. The world masters will use you. 
for the company's purpose. But our Jesus, first reason why he calls us to be his disciple is so that we may be with him, enjoy intimacy with him. He is not a user. He is a lover of his people. He invites us to greater intimacy and we get closer to him. Being is first. Then God, Jesus, gives us a purpose to do the kingdom work, to preach, to teach, to heal the people, to have a people rescued from their spiritual captivity. There's a reason, there's a mission for being together with Jesus. So there has to be being and there has to be doing. It has to, they have to cooperate together. Sometimes people misunderstanding the way of Jesus will greatly emphasize only about being or sometimes about doing. And our church, GMI, has been oftentimes criticized about our work. These guys are all workaholics. They toil, they sweat, they sacrifice, they do all the works. No, absolutely not. You know why? A tree is known by its fruit. And Jesus said, unless you abide in me, you cannot bear fruit. You cannot do anything apart from me. Being was there. Pastor Kim spent the six hours a day kneeling before Jesus and interceding and praying and listening to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Enjoying love of Jesus. Because we love Jesus and we want to do the works that he has in his heart. If this church did not know how to abide in Jesus and in his word, we will not be able to bear much fruit. With the toil, with the sweat, with the work alone, it's impossible. That has to be first intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. I myself as well. People may call me workaholic, spend many hours for church ministry, but my best hour of a day is early in the morning. I come before the Lord and spend the hours in prayer and meditating God's word, and I enjoy love of Jesus. And with that love, with that gratitude, tear has to come first before the sweat. Then I serve. Do you have a faith? Show it by your action. Do you have a love for Jesus? Show it with your service. Being and doing go hand by hand. There are two purposes why Jesus called you and I as his disciples. First, to be with him. Second, to do the kingdom of God's work together with him. Now, it says he will to send them out to preach and teach and heal and set them free as he sends out his such wonderful master. You know, I don't know if you have experienced at a work or school, you are given with a task. When you are given with a task, especially managing certain people, if you are not given task with the authority, you know how work will be so difficult. Sometimes certain leaders will give you jobs without giving you authority. But authority has to be delegated to do the kingdom's work. And Jesus also gave us all the authorities that are needed to do the kingdom works. And we can point out at least the four authority Jesus has given to every one of us as he sends us out to expand his kingdom and to do his kingdom work. Because we know, as he was sending 72 disciples out, by two by two, he said in the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 19, he said, Behold, I give you, Jesus is saying to the disciples, the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Who has a ultimate authority. Jesus, all the authority has been given to him from heaven and to earth. 
His authority, he was able to trample down scorpion and serpent. Same authority has been delegated to his disciples to go out to the world and rescue the world. So out of four authorities, first, he has given us the authority of name of Jesus. He has given us name of Jesus as we go out to the world to do the kingdom work. Name of Jesus is the highest name above any name. All the people shall bow their knees, confess Jesus is Lord. He has highest authority, his name. And that name has given to us like a badge. If you are a policeman, they can stop your car. Why? Because they are good looking? No. Because they have a badge. Because they are policemen. That's why they can stop you. Just like that. It's not because of our own righteousness. It's not because of how we look. It's not because of how much we know. It's because the name of Jesus has been given to me to engage in spiritual warfare wherever we are sent. Whether it's a company, job, workplace, family, friends, school. There we can utilize the name of Jesus to captivate the demonic forces and cast the demons out. In the book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 17, he said, And these signs shall follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons, and they will speak with the new tongues. Those are people who believe in Jesus. The name has been given. So when we go to a company, remember, every day we engage in spiritual warfare. The boss that has been hassling you, maybe it's not. Him, because our battle is not in the flesh, in the blood, but in the spiritual realm. So we bind any demonic forces, demons working through other people. We captivate them by the name of Jesus. We go earlier, like 10 minutes, pray. Use the name of Jesus. That authority has been given to every one of us. Maybe the suffering that you go through in your environment is generated by demons and you use the authority Jesus has given you. That's his name. And second authority he has given us as we go out to the world is a promise that he will answer our prayers all the time. You know what kind of privilege that is? You know what kind of power it can generate in our circumstances? You know what kind of blessings that we can invite because we have a promise from Jesus. Anything we ask in his name, he will answer our prayers. We can be Joseph in our workplaces. We can be Josephine in our school. We are sent to bless other people. Jesus said in the book of John chapter 14, verse 14, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. I will do it for you. You pray in my name. I will do it for you. Bring about God's blessing in your circumstances, in your workplaces. You are sent as ambassador of Jesus Christ. You already have that authority. Utilize it. Don't waste the blessing of prayer. It's such waste. But we do not pray for our relationships, for our circumstances. Third authority Jesus has given us is a promise that he will be with us all the way. No matter what we do, wherever we go, Jesus said, I will be with you. Our almighty God, the creator, the redeemer, the blesser, Wherever I go, he is with me. A such, such comforting promise and the power. As we know, Jesus gave great commission to his disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. In the book of Matthew chapter 20, 28, verse 19 and 20, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And behold, I will be with you until the end of the age. That's his promise. I will be with you. Not only we need to go to Israel to lead a TD in July, 
but we must go in May as well. There is a first English pastor's dress. There's in Israel, 40 to 50 pastors, Messianic Jewish pastors. These are Hebrew scholars, I heard, will be candidate, and I'll be serving as one of the spiritual leaders. Oh, Julia. If I misinterpret the Bible, they're going to come to me, Brother Shine. I'm Hebrew scholar. That's not how you interpret the Old Testament. Oh, I'm scared a little bit. But I need to remind myself, Jesus is with me. He is going to go to Jerusalem for this TD. It's not for me to reveal. It's for me to reveal Jesus to them. And I pray, Lord, humble their hearts. Because I don't trust the pastors. <laughs> Fourth authority. As we go out to the world, the authority we have is indwelling Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is in us. He is enabling, He is empowering us. And through the Spirit, He is power of resurrection can manifest within our lives, through our lives. Isn't it awesome? Jesus said to his seven disciples because he told them that he'll be going away pretty soon. But he said, I will not leave you like orphans, but I will give you another helper. In the book of John, chapter 14, verse 16, it said, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper that he, might, he may abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit comes to us and will abide in us forever. No matter what we do, if we invite His presence, His power to work through us, our environment can be changed. We have these four authorities. Name of Jesus. An answer to our prayers and Jesus abiding, being with us wherever we go, and Holy Spirit is indwelling and empowering within us. With that, our wonderful Master will send His disciples as He delegates His authority upon you and I. And the last question we want to ask to understand the way of Jesus making disciples. How did he make a disciples? After he chose these 12, even though it's not recorded, in this passage, throughout the gospel, we can understand his method. Very simple. There are three ways he made a disciples. First, he showed to them. Secondly, he did it together with them. Thirdly, he helped them to do better than himself. Very simple three ways. He showed them, and then he did it together with them, then he helped them to do better than himself. When he was casting demons out, his disciples got together and watched how he was praying for them. When he taught the people, his disciples clung together and heard how he taught the people. Everything they observed and saw and then later, Jesus will include him in his ministry when he was taking the bread and feed the 5,000 people that he took the bread and gave to his disciples. And out of the hand of his disciples, the miracles continually did happen. And they did a ministry together. Then, Jesus, being God himself, having Father's heart, wanted his disciples and followers to do better than and greater works than he has done. There can be many, many teachers. The teachers can only grow his appropriate up to his level. And if he has done that job, he has done a really wonderful job. But the father is different because the father wants his children to grow up to be better than himself and excel in many areas of society. He wants their children much, much well off than himself. That's a father's heart. And Jesus had 
their father's heart. How do we know? Because he said, in book of John, chapter 14, verse 12, this is what he said. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Not only you guys, if you believe in me, can do the works that I have done, but greater works than these you can do because that's in my heart. You can exceed me. And when we look at 12 disciples, we know they exceeded Jesus. The scale, the scope, Jesus was confined in the land of Judea, but 12 disciples took the gospel out of the boundary of Israel, went to other regions. Apostle Paul, anointed with the Holy Spirit, people will bring sick people so that he's a shadow, or was it Peter? They just pass by and receive a healing, and they receive the healing. That miracle we don't have in Jesus' ministry, but the disciples were able to perform greater miracles. Even today, there are disciples of Jesus who do greater works than Jesus had performed. And our church is one of the witnesses. And I, as a church leader, ask God almost every day to give me the Father's heart. When I see young pastors, this is my genuine desire. I want them to grow spiritually so well. And I want really them to become more effective and more powerful preachers. And go beyond that I will go. Because Father's heart. Don't ever be deceived. Just because you can go to YouTube and go to website. And you can hear dynamic preachers and teachers. That you are spiritually growing. Absolutely not. They may be the teachers. But they are not your fathers. They are not your spiritual fathers. Spiritual fathers have a relationship. Share lives together, not only the word. And this is a confession of Apostle Paul, having a father's heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, he says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. I want to be like him. I want to be a father, not an instructor alone. All of us, having fathers and mothers' heart, will engage into making disciples, hoping and praying for such people that they grow up in faith and do the greater works that I have reached. As we conclude, knowing and understanding how Jesus chose the twelve, the way he discipled, I want to quote book of Matthew, chapter 22, verse 14. It says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus called many of us. God calls many of his people to follow him, to mimic him, to be discipled, to take his mission and go beyond our own imagination. Calling is out there, but only few are chosen. Why? Only few people respond with amen. I want all of us to stand right now. And I want all of us to close our eyes. Jesus is calling us to follow him inviting us to greater intimacy with Him and take a mission of kingdom work and go to greater works than He has done. Calling is upon us. It is up to us to become chosen by responding positively. 
if you open up your heart before Jesus right now and accept this calling to be his disciple. At this moment, when we make this decision, we may not know how most likely he will use his church to continually disciple you and bring about mentors, spiritual fathers and mothers in your life. But if you receive this invitation of greater intimacy with a greater mission, would you raise your hand? Before Jesus, would you raise your hand? Many are called. All of us are called. Would you respond with an amen by raising hand to be chosen? To be included in his discipleship. You can bring your hands down. Let's call the name of Jesus and confess our decision and invite the power of Jesus to mold us, use us, and send us. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.